Hi there, and welcome to the Pearls from My Mom podcast. Every mom has special pearls of wisdom she passes on to her kids. In this podcast, we'll be talking about those pearls of wisdom, as well as the life lessons that our moms have passed down to us. We will be sharing to keep the legacy alive. Hello, hello, and welcome to Pearls from My Mom. As always, I'm Jesse. I'm your host, and I just want to take a quick second, just say thank you to everybody out there who has been downloading and listening to my episodes. I cannot tell you how much it means to me to have people out there that are listening to my story and the stories of others, so thank you so much. Now, I'm really excited that you're listening today because I'm going to be talking with Anita Heidema. She is a best-selling author the creator of Rich Life and Business Program, and she is just an all-around phenomenal business person and human being. So let's get right into it. Hello, Anita. How are you? I'm doing awesome. How are you doing? I'm fabulous. Thank you for asking. I'm so excited that you're here. I can't wait to talk to you about your mom. So let's jump right into it. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your mom? Wow. Wow. That's a big uh, open-ended question. I know. There's so many things to talk about. (laughs) Um, So, you know, my mom, my mom and dad, they came from Holland and um, there's huge background um, to that. And my mom worked always part-time as a young kid. And, uh, you know, but I always had a a really close relationship with my mom, probably until my teenage years. Then it was kind of like, you know, when you're in your teenage years, you get kind of frustrated when they tell you what to do and you don't necessarily want to listen, right? I know all about that. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So it's like, oh, you know, I was a little bit of, and I always steered a little bit away from, you know, what my parents kind of expected of me. I was supposed to be that good little girl that always looked pretty, that would get married to somebody that would take care of me. And I was always a little bit of a rebel. And so my mom and I, we would sometimes run into a few little controversies here and there. And, uh, you know, um, I, I would fight that belief, you know, and when I turned 16, I bought a car, I would do all these things, I would always, you know, work all these jobs. And they're like, No, 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 you're just supposed to stand there and be pretty. <laughs> That's all you need to do. And it wasn't necessarily, you know, what I sort of thought of. But then um, when my mom and I got really, really close was uh, when I was 19, I worked um, at a travel agency, and I won a trip to, um, to Europe. Mm-hmm. Wow. And um, it was actually England and Wales and Scotland. It wasn't Europe, sorry. Um, But I won this trip and it was a bus tour and everything. And um, my dad actually convinced me. He goes, why don't you take your mom? And I was like, are you kidding me? You know, mom's going to be so boring and mom's going to be this. (laughs) She's going to be telling me what to do all the time. And so I ended up deciding to do it. And it was a two and a half week trip. And we went into London. And I remember looking at her and saying, mom, just don't be a mom, you know, (laughs) Be my friend. Let's have some fun. You know, I was 19 and, um, you know, so we would do more fun things. I ended up, you know, the bus driver, he let me drive the bus and I can just imagine my mom was like, oh my gosh, you know, why am I allowing her to do this? (laughs) And, um, and all this, but we had so much fun and we just connected on a different level. And, you know, at 19, that it was so important. And I saw my mom in a different light, you know? And so from there on in, we just were always really, really close. We talked every day. Um, I always knew my mom was there. Um, even though sometimes we'd have a little bit of controversy and she'd be frustrated with me and we'd, you know, but I think because we were so close, that would happen. And, um, so it was kind of difficult. And then when I was 26, my dad got sick and my mom and I got even closer. And I do have a brother, but um, <clears throat> he wasn't as directly involved and he's in Vancouver right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so it always seemed like my mom and I together and, and we were, you know, helping nurse my dad. So we got even closer then. And then my dad passed away and, you know, I was, you know, inviting her to everything. She was always staying at my house. So we were really, really, really close, you know, always doing things together. And uh, when the kids were born, the same thing, you know, she'd come to visit all the time. She was so so involved in the kids' lives, and um, yeah, so it was it was a really uh, a difficult um, you know time when all of a sudden I could see that she was having this memory loss and she was kind of changing, mm-hmm. you know, um, that things kind of changed a little bit. So, did you want me to continue on with my story, or do you have more questions? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that would have to I be my breath here. <laughs> I know, I know, I I'm just captivated. I'm listening. Um, I. I think that would be really tough. And my mom, she passed away when she was 65. So she wasn't, you know, getting older at all or anything. And I know that one thing that she was really scared of, because part of her cancer, it was lung cancer, but it went into her brain. 
And she was terrified of losing her faculties. She was just so afraid that she was, you know, going to start forgetting things or not knowing things. So to have to watch your mom go through that, I'm sure was um, devastating. I'm sure it was really mm-hmm. awful for both you and her. Yeah, well, um, both my parents are very, very proud people. And my dad had had lung cancer. He had something called mesothelioma. I don't know if you're if you're familiar with that, but mm-hmm. it's actually a cancer that's in the lining of the pleura of the lungs. So it's 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 really directed to asbestos exposure. Mm-hmm. And um, the same thing with him. Like it was around the, you know, they 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 they're so proud, and it's so hard for you to see them. And when I came in to help nurse him, and I'm having to do some things that are with them that are a little bit more than he would want his daughter to do. But, mm-hmm. you know, I had to do it to make him comfortable. And I had to, to do these things. Um, you know, the same thing with my mom and to see my mom go through that decline, because she's also very proud and, and forgetting things. And, you know, as I'm getting older, I'm noticing I'm forgetting things too. And, and you always, it always sort of wonders well, what's going on. And, and, you know, because I was sort of more involved with her and what was happening, I'm seeing these changes. I'm asking people and they're saying, well, you know, your mom's in her seventies now, you know, and she was always so, you know, one thing I really learned from my mom was to, to keep yourself healthy. Like she was one of those, I don't know if you remember, but there used to be this show called Ed Allen. It was a fitness show. She would be doing those as a kid mm-hmm. when I was a kid. And, you know, I, I remember when I was six years old doing yoga with my mom, you know, and I mean, I'm 50 now, so that's quite a few years ago. And yoga was just starting to come to Western society. And my mom was always, you know, so much more advanced in those things and, and keeping herself healthy that, you know, when her memory loss started to come, it was just so shocking because I figured my mom would live to 200. There's just no other way mm-hmm. uh, because she was such a healthy, organic everything and did everything right for her body, right? For sure. And uh, seeing that decline in her memory and, and her fighting it too, like that was the biggest thing. She'd say, no, that's not, you know, and I go, well, mom, and, and trying to be, um, um, I don't know how to word it, but trying to be... Um, you know, supportive for her and not embarrass her in any way. You mm-hmm. know, it's it was always a challenge in, in how to direct that. Oh, for sure. I can imagine. Now, and I, I always like to give people context. So how long has it been since your mom's been gone? Um, well, my mom died at 82 years ago. So it'll be three years in April. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, th- I think probably when my dad died at 63, my mom was 60. Mm-hmm. And I probably started knowing signs or probably saw signs probably in her 70s of little things here and there, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, as, and as people age, you know, technology changes. So she couldn't understand the concept of a computer. Well, is that part of a brain thing or is that part of a society and, and society changing? I mean, I know my kids can get into things so much quicker than me and I'm just lost. Mm-hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the brain thing as much, but more of a technology changes and it's just so advanced that we don't even grasp the comprehension of, of what that is, you know? So, uh, you know, I saw signs, but I wasn't always a hundred percent sure. For sure. Now, and we had talked a little bit before this, but there was a misdiagnosis in your mom's case, right? Yeah. So, um, as time went on, I, I was looking at trying to get, um, you know, care for her and, and how to, without insulting her, get in to see her doctor's appointments. And and of course, um, as you probably know, being through it, you know, it's not always as easy to speak on behalf of your parents because you don't always have the rights to be able to, right? So she didn't always want me to come because I would I would say to the doctor something. And my parents always had this vision that the doctor isn't what they don't know is okay. Right. That they didn't want she didn't want me to. And she's like, Oh, the doctor says I'm in great health and so my mom ended up having a fall and um that kind of opened up a little bit of a gates for me to take her to the doctor um, and and speak on behalf of what was going on. And, and, you know, when she turned around the corner, I'd say to him, you know, can you please look at her memory? Because it was a new doctor, actually, that didn't know her from before. So they weren't sure mm-hmm. to connect the, the dots. And so um, from there, it opened up a whole can of worms that, you know, he goes, well, I'm going to have her go for some testing. So next thing I know, and it, and it was so hard because she didn't want to go. And I went, mom, we have to go for some testings. And, and, um, you know, she was so in denial of what was going on, which is understandable because it'd be scary for anybody. Right. Mm-hmm, for sure. And, um, <clears throat> so we went into this clinic and basically within that time period they did this clock test and all these other things and the doctor pulled me in and didn't pay any attention to my mom my mom was sitting on the table and said you know your mom has alzheimer's it's in the farther stages of our alzheimer's um you're in charge of her now you make sure that her car is taken away you make sure she dresses properly you make sure you're blah, blah, blah. and i remember sitting there like oh my gosh you're saying this in front of my mom my mom's looking because she's understanding part of it but not really mm-hmm. 
and all these things that all of a sudden I had to take care of. And at that, at that time, um, I had worked in corporate in the paper industry for years and years, and I had just started uh, my business, mm-hmm. right? So, um, and I had two mortgages to pay, and I had all this stuff, and all of a sudden I'm being thrown the extra care of my mom and the responsibility because they said, you know, if she gets in a car accident, you're liable for it, and you're the, and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, where do I go with this? I didn't know where to get help or what to do, so they basically had diagnosed her at that point with Alzheimer's. Um, they had given her medication. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, when I, I brought my mom into my home for a time period and then she'd run out in the streets and she didn't want to be at the house. And then I bring her back to her house and I was trying to get in care and people that would help and she wouldn't let them in the door. And it was just, it seemed like, you know, years and years of, of, of going back and forth that, um, you know, she wasn't really getting the medication on a regular basis. So sporadically she would get this medication. Well, it got to a point where, um, I, I mean, she had to go in the hospital. The neighbors were calling because it was just unsafe for her. And I had to look for a home for her um, to go to for me to be able to to manage this because nobody else. And, the, and at that point, they had um, changed the care to me so that I had control over her care because they realized that she was unsafe to herself, right? Mm-hmm. And that I had the wits about me that had the best her best interest in mind. It wasn't necessarily anything else. So I looked for a, a place that had... Um, care that had, um, you know, a memory unit that would give her activities. And I figured, okay, if she got her medication on a regular basis and they gave her these stimulating activities that she would excel. And I, I really truly believe, and I still always believe that, you know, there's always that hope and you hear about these miracles and you, you hear about these things and I'm like, oh, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, at that time, um, I was working on my business too. I had written the book, the book started becoming Amazon bestseller. I'm juggling this all back and forth. And, um, so my mom ended up going into the home. Um, then, unfortunately, um, she started to get the medica- medication on a regular basis. And um, next thing you knew, she wasn't, she was shuffling her feet. She wasn't able to really talk properly. Her motor skills started to go. And um, I remember one time being called in. I was actually down in the States <clears throat> doing a book signing for my book. And I got called that I had to come in right away, that my mom had basically two hours or two days to live. And and this is within like a couple weeks of our week of seeing her, not even, Mm -hmm. that she had changed so drastically. Um, And when she was in the hospital, there was a neurologist that said, you know what, your mom doesn't have Alzheimer's. She has neuro, um, she has Lewy body dementia. And... um, the medication, unfortunately, that uh, they've been giving her is speeding up the mobility portion of what she has. Um, so they were able to detect the memory portion of it. But Louis body shows signs of Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. And so the medication that she took ended up speeding up her mobility issues. And um, she was at a point almost of no return. At that point, they said, we're going to take away the medication. She's going to do some physio because at that point she couldn't even walk. Like she went that quick Mm -hmm. and she wasn't eating as well. And uh, so within two months, all of a sudden she went from a bit of memory loss to speech mobility to not being able to walk, um, not being able to eat. And uh, the medication wasn't pulled quick enough. And um, because she wasn't able to eat, she ended up passing away within two months. Um, I remember them telling me, you know, we have to pull the feeding tube. There's nothing else we could do. And I I was just flabbergasted. I just could not understand how this could happen, you know. And um, so as I've gone on learning more and more about Louis body and sharing the message and and doing all the other stuff, there's, you know, there's been a lot that's transpired since then, right? Mm -hmm. That's heartbreaking. That was just... Absolutely. I mean, all death is heartbreaking, but just to know that it didn't have to happen. Were you bitter at all? I, I feel like I would be really bitter. <laughs> you know what? I, I, I think in all my training, because I mean, I've gone through years of a lot of crap happening, as, as a lot of us have, and we've been through stuff and all the training of always to see the, the light at the end of the tunnel and see things from a positive light. Um, I, I would I seem to find a switch in, in being able to turn that around. And sometimes it's been to my default, actually, because people have taken advantage or I end up losing, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> seeing things that way. But I find it's, it's helped for me. Um, you know, I, I, one thing, I, I haven't really gone that much publicly except for, for speaking on this. So this is somewhat new. Um, when I was doing book signings down in the States, and I can't say the company name, and I'll explain to you in a little bit why, mm-hmm. Um 
when I was called that my mom was dying in two hours or two days, um, the company called me. Um, oh, sorry, I was called to to see my mom in the hospital. Um, I was sitting there on my mom's deathbed, and you can relate to this, and like just feeling overwhelmed all by myself, right? Holding her hand as she's sitting there just breathing and, and living off this feeding tube. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm going to probably start crying. That's okay. um, but I got a phone call that I was being sued. And the company that I did the book signings for because I had to leave um, was suing me for $10,000. Oh, God. <clears throat> and, um, and I remember sitting there in that moment thinking, oh, my gosh. Like, is there anything else that can come at me? You know, I have my daughter that's going through some stuff. That's a whole other story. I've got my business that I'm bringing up. And I, I, I basically have just been through a divorce. I have two mortgages. Like, I just, you know, is there anything else that could possibly happen? And as I sat there, I, I came up with an idea, and it's it's the thing I'm telling you about, how you feel bitter. And there was a little bit of bitterness in there, but I thought, how do I turn this into a different message? So I got a hold of um, um, a legal service that I deal with in Toronto, and I said, I want you to go back to them, and I want you to tell them, uh, <clears throat> yes, I will pay the $10,000, but I have three conditions. And I forget actually what the second condition was, but the main one was um, <clears throat> that I can come back and basically it was in the States and they had a large mailing list. So I thought, okay, well, I can maybe, I'm going to go back there. I'm going to work my butt off to sell books and to really promote my programs and make that $10,000 back and then use their clients. So I'm going to be, my first condition was that I come back and I still do what I was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. That was condition one. And the condition two, as a speaker, I was going to get up and I was going to speak on behalf of how big industry doesn't care about family anymore. Whoa. Hear that this is more important to them to do something like this, then understand, you mm -hmm. know, because what they said is they came to me two weeks later and said, you told us your mom was dying in two hours or two days. And it's been two weeks. Mm -hmm. And that was their thing. Well, uh, for, you know, you, it's something like that. You never know what's going to happen. Right. Totally. So it was so important to make sure that I came. So my lawyer says to me, Oh my God, you're brilliant. You should be a lawyer. And I said, no, <laughs> if I was a lawyer, I'd be suing them right now. So <laughs> So I said, so they came back and they said, you know, here's $5,000 up front, come whenever you want. And um, when you do come, please don't, or whenever you say anything, don't mention who we are. So I never mention who they are, but I always find there's a learning lesson around that. And same thing with my mom, you know, I was bitter and I, you know, everyone's telling me, oh, sue the doctor, sue the this, but and I thought, you know what, that's, my mom would be turning over in her grave right now you know like if I was to do that like how can I bring this in a positive light mm -hmm. and how can I share that you know um, proper diagnosis is so important right and they're in California I read something recently that they're coming up with a cure for Lewy body dementia right and a lot of people don't know about it like every time I talk about it they're like what Louie what mm -hmm. you know Alzheimer's has got a big organization in in Canada and and you know working through them and I, I want I'm just building money in this bank account that's under the Fena Heidema Louis Body Foundation with every program I sell, every book, every book launch I do to eventually do a walk across Canada to talk about Louis Body and how the diagnosis is a bit different, mm -hmm. right? So I've turned that that anger in the situation to a positive way to think, okay, how can I use my mom's name in a different way, similar to what you're doing and you're helping to share, mm -hmm. you know, with your mom's story and, and, and share the message with everybody else, right? And it's so important. Okay. Um, to be able to do that. That's awesome. I think taking, you know, something that you could easily turn very bitter about and you could easily get angry and, and I'm sure there are moments of that, but to turn it into this foundation, it's the Fena Heidema Louis Body Dementia Foundation. Yeah, it's, it's called the Louis Body Foundation. I didn't okay. I put the dementia in it, but um, okay. it's on my website, anitaheidema.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see it there and like proceeds of my book and all my programs I sell online and, and I've done some um, some fundraisers where I've um, you know done various things, and people have come forth that I remember this one lady. She actually um, had Louis body, but was diagnosed properly. Mm -hmm. And the transformation, like she was out exercising three times a week. You know, she had the right medication in the right way. So she's, you know, fortunately she still has Louis body dementia, but you know, the right treatment, there's so much more. And, and now with you know they say there's cures coming up, and you know what's happened. What's happening? You were hoping that, you know, there would be something more. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. Well, I'm I'll be happy to direct people to that website because I think that that's that's an incredible example 
of turning a, a negative into a positive. So I'm yeah. happy happy to hear that you're doing that work. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, it, it, a lot of people, they don't know about it, but Robin Williams, I mean, I mentioned to you, had Lewy body dementia. Like everyone says that he passed away because of depression, but his wife says that he wasn't depressed at the time, number one. Mm-hmm. Um, number two, he was, he was diagnosed with Parkinson's and that's one of the other diagnosing factors. You're either a diagnosed with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. And some people say he died because he was diagnosed with Parkinson's, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But at the actual autopsy, they did the autopsy, they were conclusive that it was Lewy body dementia. And Lewy body dementia, you have hallucinations. So his wife believes the hallucinations that he had, you know, caused him to kill himself, right? And a lot of people don't know these stories. Um, I also was speaking to a group of business entrepreneurs, there were a thousand in the room. And 20 and I told the story about my mom and 26 people out of that group came back to me and said they had their loved one re-diagnosed and they had Lewy body dementia like it's huge out there but no mm-hmm. one's talking about it. it's all kind of lumped in with the dementia and but with proper diagnosis there's such a change that can happen mm-hmm. right and it's just a thing of going to your doctor like I am not a doctor by any means all I do is tell my story I, I don't want to know too much because I don't want to, you know, mislead anybody in any way because I'm not a doctor. I've never been trained as a doctor. But the importance is if you notice, you know, if they've been diagnosed with Parkinson's or Alzheimer's and they're having hallucinations or, you know, there's something a little bit different from the diagnosis, say, you know, to your doctor, is it could it be possibly, you know, Louis body? And they would take them to a neurologist and the neurologist would either diagnose or not diagnosis and give the proper treatment, right? But from what I've seen and, and this whole thing coming out, it's it with, with my mom and Louie body, there's just been so much that has been shared and awareness around it, you know? Mm-hmm. For sure. I think that's amazing. I'm, I'm sure that she would be really proud of you for doing that. Work Aww, thank you. And helping others. And that's amazing. So do you have, I know that you said you went on that awesome trip with her, which sounds incredible, by the way. Um, mm-hmm. Is there like, what's, do you have a favorite memory, a favorite something that we can brighten our day with? Well, I, there's so many memories with my mom, right? Like we just were very, very close. Um, you know, even when she was sick, you know, she'd always want to snuggle in bed with me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I never got any sleep. I actually had to do earplugs and eye masks because she'd be getting up all the time. That's part of one thing with Louis bodies. They don't know day and night. So they get up all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, we just had this con- connection of, of close friends. And, um, you know, yeah, we would fight. And there was times where I was frustrated and I thought, that she was, you know, playing games with her, with her memory and, and, and saying things that she shouldn't be saying. And, and, you know, I had to come to terms with all that, but we've had so many great memories over the years. We've done great trips together. You know, when I took the kids down to Florida, we'd get driving trips. My mom would come. Like it was always, she was always part of everything in my life. And, and that was the hard part was when I didn't have her to call mm-hmm. anymore. You know, but I had a little bit of that transition because I kind of lost my mom, you know, a few years before all this happened because she was changing and she was getting a little bit um, angry when I was, you know, having to say certain things or mom, you know, be careful for this. And, and, you know, there was a little bit of, you know, anger in her, Mm -hmm. which is understandable and what she was going through because she was confused and lost and and scared. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, being compassionate towards that. But we've just had so many great memories. Um, It's been great. I think that's amazing and and the fact that she got to be a part of your kids life did she just love being a grandma like my mom loved being a grandma yeah (laughs) she was the first one to be on the floor and she'd be playing with them and and uh, you know I didn't have that because my grandparents lived in Holland so um, I don't really have uh, much of a family here so um, you know she'd get down there and she'd be right away playing with cards and all cars and all these different things and bringing them treats and <laughs> mm-hmm. but everything we did you know like we go for a school trip and I'd take the time off my mom wanted to come and we'd do all these different adventures and and hikes and she always wanted to be involved in it and and because my dad had passed away you know she had more of that time I think you know because my, my dad passed away a year before my son was born mm-hmm. so he never had that experience to meet my children so yeah, that's got to be hard. Yeah, yeah. But it was, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's a tough thing, you know, mm-hmm. and it's part of life, unfortunately, you know. For sure, I do know. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, what do you what do you do now? Like, what is your relationship like with her now? And how did you how have you kind of kept her alive with your family? Do you have traditions or those kind of things that you still do? Yeah. Well, I, I do believe that there's something else out there that we don't quite know and understand. Mm-hmm. Um, I know when my dad passed away, um, it, we, he always said that if there was an afterlife, we're going to come back. 
And I remember um, it was the two days after he passed away. All of a sudden, I had this warm feeling that he was there, and it was scared the living daylights out of me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was like, "Oh no, I made that. I made that agreement when I was, you know, when I was much younger, and I thought it was cool. And now it's like, oh my gosh." Um, and there's always been that feeling of presence when they've been there in my life. Um, before 11, 11 became big, my dad would always have, um, he would have his appointments on the 11th and he died on the 11th. So 11, 11 was a huge thing. And there would always be things that would happen. There would be this song that came on the radio that was 11, 11. And I even say it to my mom when she was around. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I still feel that there's a little bit of, of that presence there, both of them. Um, and as far as traditions, I mean, yeah, I mean, they're both um, in a, uh, buried at a tree um, that I have both their names at. And there's always a tradition to go and see them. Um, keeping the Dutch tradition alive, you know, is, is really, really important. And, and, and just always keeping that memory of them in, in the kids' lives, you know, mm-hmm. um, is always so important in the, in the lessons that we've learned, right? Yeah, for sure. My kids are little, so I'm I, I was like terrified they were not going to remember my mom. So I try to talk about her as much. I sing the same. So she had like a song for each kid. So I make sure to sing those songs for them. Um, so I, I get what you're saying. It's important to kind of keep her around and and have her in your life still. So I think that's yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Now, and the kids see it a bit differently as well, right? So yeah, I know it's hard. I mean, my mine are little, so it's hard for them to kind of understand. And mm-hmm. at the most awkward times, they'll say like, "Are you sad that Grandma's dead?" And <laughs> you know, like I'm like, "Yeah, I'm sad," um, but you know, I think that's just how they process it. It's different too, right? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. For sure. How how has how was the grieving process for you? Um. You know, and I have both both sides because of my mom and my dad. So my mm-hmm. my dad, it 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 hit me really hard. Really, I know we're not supposed to be talking about fathers, but it's it kind of ties in with my grieving. So I hope you're okay with me talking about it. No, it's absolutely okay. I, lo- I love dads too. We're good. Yeah. Um. You know, I was I was so lost, and I went through that stage where I didn't want to be at his at his funeral. I I figured it was for everybody else, and I'd already said my goodbyes, and I had helped nurse him and and been through all of that. So, mm-hmm. um for me to go through anything more was difficult. And, and, you know, I, it was just an odd time that when someone, I couldn't get a hold of them, Mm -hmm. I'd freak out thinking that they had died. Like it was so weird. I was just so caught up in this weird spiral of things, but I, you know, I was quite young. It was probably the first loss, big loss I had because my family was all in Holland and yes, they passed away, but I never had that true closeness to them to that extent, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And with my mom, um, yeah, the grieving process has been difficult, but I think, um, coming up with this foundation because my mom died um, um, Easter weekend in April two years ago mm-hmm. and um, Mother's Day was not too long after mm-hmm. so jumping on the bandwagon of this Louis body dementia and tying my book that's what I originally did it was tie my book into it mm-hmm. I remember that first day I got up on, on stage and I spoke on behalf of my mom and I didn't cry that day believe it or not I cry more now <laughs> I don't know what got in me that I was able to you know um, be able to say what I had to say and the message I had to share. But I think it's kind of helping me with some of the grieving process, mm-hmm. um, knowing that I'm helping others and that feeling of that, because I really have um, a lot of guilt that goes behind it because I put my mom in that home and I feel a lot of guilt behind that because she went in the home, she got the medication she needed, and then she died. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, with my dad, I didn't feel as much of that guilt because I, I know I gave everything I could and, and did everything I could and researched and went to all the doctors. And yeah, I could have done more. But with my mom, I made that choice. And it was a hard one to do because I didn't always feel right by it. And this is what caused her to to be the way she was, right? Mm-hmm. And am I God? And am I knowing everything? No, but they're still in that. So, you know, the grieving process has been a little bit harder in, in other ways, but with helping others, it's it's been good to be able to, you know, at least share that message and help other people in this situation and reach out to them. So Oh, I can imagine. And you know, I mean, you're a mom and you had you know, you had a mom and so you know that she would tell you, obviously you can't feel any of that guilt. Like it's totally yeah, unfair yeah, for yeah, you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I know, know, I know. <laughs> I have a little bit of guilt too, because I lived in Canada when my mom was sick and you know, I always told myself if my parents ever got sick, I'd drop everything and you know, but I could I couldn't drop my life. And I visited quite a bit, but I couldn't and I was there when she you know, physically passed away. Uh, but I couldn't be there for those last eight months and, and so I f- held a lot of guilt for that. But she wouldn't want you to. 
So yeah, yeah. I get and that's it. a horrible thing too when you see them taking their last breath. I mean, it's such a a horrible feeling, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So anyway, that's all right. Yeah, that's we a... could go on forever about all the stuff behind it. And, I know, um, but... you know, it's just it's one of those those horrible things, you know. You lose people in your life, and and you know, uh, trying to turn that into you know, life again, and there is life out there. And, and, and those other things that you're responsible for, it's difficult. And, you know, with both my parents gone, you know, even though I was always been very independent and, and um, very much strong on your feet, you feel like you've lost everything, you know, like when you said you feel so alone, that's what it is, is because, you know, my parents, I always kind of knew they were there to pick up if something happened to me, if I, you know, if something fell down or I had to move in or they, you know, whatever that would be, I knew they were always there for me. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden that, that foundation is gone, right? For sure. For sure. It's, yeah. it's tough. And that's why we have to keep the pearls of wisdom that they gave us in our hearts at all times. And that's what this show is called. So mm-hmm. what kind of pearls, it could be like a, an actual thing that your mom said or like a way that she lived her life. But what is your favorite pearl of wisdom that you got from your mom? Um, I, there's so many of them, but I know she was really important on, on, on keeping yourself healthy mm-hmm. and, um, you know, eating the right foods, um, living every moment and every day, um, to the fullest and, and keeping yourself healthy. Now, unfortunately, I mean, I, I can't figure out how this ended up happening to her. I think it's maybe pesticides that she had when she lived on a farm when she was a kid, because my mom was the epitome of health, eating all the right foods, mm-hmm. everything organic, like, it, you know, um, but I still truly believe in what she said, you know, living a healthy lifestyle and living every day, um, to its fullest, you know, is probably what my mom's pearl of wisdom, you know, would be. So. Well, and she lived to be 82, you said, right? 80. 80. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty good, you know, <laughs> like, and so, and it, it obviously worked for her. So I think that's a great pearl of wisdom and, and I can tell that you're living your life that way too, because you you're looking awesome. You're looking like you're real healthy. So that's great. Oh, I do my best. Yeah, you don't have to. That's all you can do. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Cool. So any last little bit of advice that you might have for somebody that maybe just lost their mom or, you know, that might have been even going through the same type of feelings that you were going through? Any advice for them? Um, you know, I, I think the biggest thing is, is, you know, people like you that are bringing everyone together to hear the message, you know, to know that you're not the only one, um, grieving process is, is, is somewhat standard, but it's different for everybody, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you go through the roller coaster of, of turmoil and, and, but yet everyone still does it on a different level and what that is and, and just respect that it takes time. You know, I, I look at when my mom just passed away to now, and and kind of where that's gone and and there's still moments I cry myself to sleep at night you know with the loss of her and Mm -hmm. and everything that's gone through um you know find what that is and 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 speak to people and make sure you have that support you know to carry through you know for me it's it's you know the foundation that I created and sharing the message I have a Facebook group as well it's called the Fenahidema Louis Body Foundation Mm -hmm. um you know the organization where I said you know I'm eventually want to do a walk across Canada and tie in with you know care providers, you know, doctors, whatever that is to be able to share the message on a, on a, on a higher term and, and be able to help people mm-hmm. understand the differences between Parkinson's, Alzheimer's and Lewy body dementia, because, you know, there can be a different treatment um, plan that's going to work for you. And, you know, you, you won't end up in the same situation where my mom is. And, and this is, this is very common, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned that, like people that I've related to that I've reached out to, you know, I, there's so many hundreds of people that have, you know, that I've reached out to just alone, I can't even imagine, that have died unnecessarily without being diagnosed properly. So it is a very huge thing out there. And, um, you know, um, it, it's just sharing that message and, and, and connecting with those people that can help support you, right? Oh, for sure. And you're you're doing such amazing work. So I think that I think that's phenomenal. I think you I look up to you a lot. I think you're a phenomenal woman business person as I mentioned in the beginning you're a best-selling author you've got a business program so and listeners may have noticed that you are no stranger to the mic because you're also a podcaster as well Mm -hmm. so I like talking a lot yeah me too (laughs) (laughs) me too so let's plug some of that stuff your your podcast is awesome it's called aha moments 
aha moments to success yes. so it's my podcast um i've also got an ask anita um tv series that's on youtube that i, I give tips to entrepreneurs and where they're going to go um my book is vitality Knox, uh amazon bestseller three years ago and it's about a girl named vitality and her life lessons um and i'm going to be doing some changes to add some things about louis body in that book eventually but you can find that at my website um anita heidema h-e-i-d-e-m-a dot com Excellent. And uh, the various programs that I do online about living a rich life and, and for entrepreneurs, you know, they get lost in the hustle and bustle of, of, of their business and get lost in what they're really wanting in life. And then I have a business program that carries them from A to B and business plan to sales to everything that you need to to monetize your business and be successful. Right. So mm -hmm. um, it's it's all in there in the website. That's awesome. So I will put all those links down there. And I'm definitely hoping that people come check you out. If they want to reach you, I'll put your email address there as well. It's ah at anitahayama.com. Thank, thank you. Yeah, I'm just so thankful that you came on here. I think your story is heartbreaking and beautiful and inspirational and all of that wrapped into one. And I, I admire the work that you're doing so much. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And come on over to my quiz on the line that has what kind of famous entrepreneur are you? It's kind of cool. I saw that <laughs> on your Facebook page this morning and I was like, I'm going to take that when we're off the phone. <laughs> I turned out to be Steve Jobs. It was kind of fun. So, oh, cool. Uh, That's a good one. I'll take it. Yeah. Cool. yeah, yeah, I'll take that. I thought it would have been uh, Richard Branson because I figure I'm more like him, but I'll take Steve Jobs. Yeah, yeah, I think that, that would be okay. That would be an okay second choice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Jesse. I really enjoyed chatting with you, and I love your, your podcast. Thank you, Anita. Same here. Talking with Anita was great, and you can really tell, you can feel the passion that she has for the Fena Heidema Louis Body Foundation. And if you want to check out all of that, I will put the links to her website and everything in the show notes. But I just do hope that you go check out the work that she's doing because she is really an absolutely phenomenal businesswoman and human being. So as always, if you enjoyed our episode today, there are many ways you can support the podcast. You can hit subscribe and share with your friends, please. If you know somebody that's going through the griefing process, whether it's been five minutes or 50 years, share this with them and hopefully it will, will help and, and resonate with them. And you can also leave us a review on iTunes. If you're feeling generous, I do have a Patreon account, which you can go on there and pledge a couple dollars. And there are some great rewards like stickers and things like that on there. And for questions, comments, suggestions, or if you'd like to tell your own story, my email is share at pearlsfrommymom.com. So please email me there. Or you can hit me up at pearlsfrommymom at gmail.com. I'd also like to invite you to check out our Instagram, Facebook, Twitter at Pearls for my mom. And I have a Facebook group if you are looking for some support and you'd like to connect with other people. I'll put the link to that in the show notes as well. And thank you so much for listening. And as always, keep sharing to keep the legacy alive.